Hello, and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have on with us returning guest, Ron Miscavige. Ron, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, and I'm happy to be here. Ron, there's some exciting news. You just released something I want the audience to know about. Can you tell us what it is? Yeah, uh, yes, I can. Well, there's two things I could tell you. Number one, I started my own podcast, and it's called Ron Miscavige, Life After Scientology. And it's a little bit of a different take on the church and my dealings with them of 42 years plus. But the main thing I wanted to tell you about was if you've read my book, and of course you have, Jeffrey, and I'm sure many of your listeners have. I'm your biggest fan. Well, there you you go. Listen, I talk about a time uh, in 1974 where I recorded an album. I recorded this album. It went on Polydor Records. And I had a writer's contract with Chapels Publishing. And fortunately, the my agent at Chapels Publishing, the guy's name was, uh, I think, Trevor Timmer. He was on standby one day, and a guy by the name of Bill Bebb from BBC Record, BBC called him and said he wanted to see me. So I went in with Trevor, and uh, he offered me to play on BBC. Wow. And this, this is the album that he heard, and he, he kind of raved about it, which really knocked me out at the time. I thought it was good, but he talked about production qualities, ingenious type writing and all kinds of stuff. And at that time, um, I hate to say this, but when I presented this to my family, everybody wanted to go back to the States. So I couldn't stay there. And the the reason I had to stay there for a while, the, the quarter had to end up, which meant we had to stay there for about an extra two months. And honestly, I was running out of money at the time, uh, just doing side gigs. But I felt if I could, you know, tighten our belt, maybe we could just work out something where we made enough money to keep us going. I could have stayed there and recorded that. At any rate, that's uh, maybe a short story made long. But this album is now digitized and you can get this on either Amazon, iTunes or Google Play. It's called Ron Miscavige Timeless. And this is the actual album that uh, Bill Bebb heard from BBC and uh, offered me the deal to stay there. So I'm I'm pretty proud of it. It's Timeless by Ron Miscavige, available on Amazon. I've listened to it. It's a fabulous album. You're quite the trumpet player. Well, I thank you very much. But let me me tell you, there's a story behind this that uh, uh, other than people who knew me at the time or maybe friends, I never told. And I wouldn't mind going into it now because it has to do with my first dealings with the church and somebody in an executive position. Do you mind if I go into that, Jeffrey? Oh, please. Yeah, I want to hear the story. Okay. Well, first of all, no matter where I would go in those days, whether it was maybe out in L.A. Of course, I lived in the Philadelphia area or when we went to England. I'd always get together with some musicians and start a band. This is 1974. I took my family to England for the second time. The first time we went there between 72 and 73 for about a year and three months. And then uh, I went over in 1974. So I had a band and we used to play at uh, local venues. Um, The Dorset Arms was the one we played at. And we were such a hit that our, that, that pub would be filled with locals and Scientologists, and we were a great PR action for the church at the time. As a matter of fact, L. Ron Hubbard actually gave us all a commendation for the work that we did over there. And he said as part of that combination that the church should help us in any way possible with equipment or anything to facilitate all of the things we were doing to increase the PR. Now, the guys I had in the band were guys who worked on staff. They weren't in the Sea Org, and I was public. I was not in the Sea Org at the time, and we were there. I took my whole family over to study Scientology. So this is in St. Hill uh, in the United Kingdom. That's right, St. Hill, East Grinstead. Like, I had a piano player, Tommy Armstead. He worked in the, they called the franchise office, which then turned into what's called the mission office. Uh, another guy who played trombone worked for the G.O., and another guy, we was kind of in the Sea Org, but it was pretty loose in those days. Dave Haskins, he was my drummer, a uh, very dear friend of mine at the time. Well, he still is, as a matter of fact. But now we have these guys who don't have two pennies to rub together. And they all need something, like we needed a piano for 
uh, our piano player because we could only book gigs where they had a regular piano. So we wanted to get a Fender Rhodes and we needed a speaker for the bass player. So now I get the dealing with a guy by the name of Herbie Parkhouse. He was financed there for the GO at the time. Yeah, I've heard that. I, I, yeah, he's very well known in the church. Okay, good. Yeah. So we went to him and he begrudgingly gave us money for equipment. And he also loaned us money for to, to buy a van so we could go around and do these gigs. Now, the money for the van was a loan, and I took the responsibility for paying that thing back. The equipment that he bought for us, he said to me, if the band ever breaks up, it was my responsibility to get that equipment back to the church. And maybe there'd be other bands who'd want to do the same thing so they could use that to loan out to other people. Yeah. You follow me so far? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so now, I, I've had, I had a couple of meetings with them. They all went badly, and uh, I, I was just glad to get out of his presence because he uh, had a tendency of wanting to intimidate people, and yeah, I, don't, I don't go for that stuff. So anyway, we did get the equipment, and we made three demos of what the album would be, and we were doing gigs. We were playing in London like six nights a week. Just a fabulous time, actually, to be honest with you. So we did the album, and I went to London, and I was on the street there for about six weeks. And I finally got a deal with Paul, with uh, Polydor Records. That was uh, Gordon Gray. That was the A&R guy, artist and repertoire, which was a great win. And then about a week later, Chapels called me, and they gave me a writer's contract. And then this then led to Bill Bebb here in this, and he offered me to play on BBC. Now, getting back to that equipment. Yeah. <laughs> in the meantime, you know, this, I hope everybody's following on this, but I'm, I think I'm giving it pretty clearly. Sure. The band breaks up. They wanted to go back to the States also. So I'm over there sitting on Grosvenor Road trying to work out how I could get this equipment back. And I say, I'm trying to work out how to get it back for this reason. I tried to get it back and I couldn't even get to speak to Herbie. I was stonewalled for talking to him. So one day I went there early, early in the morning and Maureen Brigatti, who was his communicator, pulled up in her car and I stood outside the car and she knew I was standing there and she messed around with her purse and in other words, make do a bet for a good 15 minutes. Finally, she got out of the car. And I said, Maureen, listen, I got to get this equipment back to Herbie. She said, Ron, you owe the money for that. He did not want the equipment back. He wanted you to pay for that equipment. It was a loan. <laughs> I'll tell you something. That floored me. Now, this yeah. is my first experience with somebody in an executive position for the church. Follow how this goes now. Okay. I thought, you son of a bitch. Oh, boy. Now I have no way to do it. They're not going to take it. We're going to go back to the States, and he's going to bill me for this. So I'm sitting in uh, Grosvenor Road one day, and I hear a knock on the door. I open the door, and there's a guy standing there who works in the estates org. Now, for the listeners who don't know what that is, that's the people who would be in charge of all of the properties, keeping it up, maintaining it, building new things. And he said to me, Ron, I understand you have some speakers and some equipment. I said, yes, I do. Why do you say? And he says, well, Jane Kember and David Gaiman and some other of the execs in the GEO are going to give a speech. And they need some equipment. Could we borrow it from you? I said, hey, listen, man, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll make a deal with you. If you sign for every piece of equipment, you can have it. You can take it for nothing. He said, oh, that is wonderful. So I stood there with a clipboard, carefully marked down every piece of equipment that I had. He signed for it. And that's the chicanery I had to resort to to get that back, Jeffrey. <laughs> but at least, at least you were I mean, you were you were able to unload it back onto the church. Yes, but now follow this even a little further. Watch how this goes. Sure. So now, I go 
I go back to the States. I really didn't want to go because this was the, the biggest break of my lifetime. To be honest with you, a big disappointment to me. I talk about it in the book in case anybody's interested. You, you can see a complete detailed story of it. But I now go back to the States. I'm starting to make money again. I took on a sales job and some musical gigs. I got some money together and I sent a check to Herbie Parkhouse with a copy of the album. Okay. Okay, so what does Herbie do? Now, the album was received. I checked with the bank. Five months later, the check was never cashed. Well, how much was the check for? I mean, it was like maybe $500 in, in the area of $500 because we bought a used van. There was a guy over there, Raul de Normanville. He was the used car salesman for everybody who went to St. Hill. And he did pick up heaps. And sell them at a good price because you know everybody was tapped because they were spending their money on courses and services. So that <laughs> check went to Herbie. Now, th th listen, listen to this. So I thought, how am I going to get this back to him? So I'm doing services at the time. And I went to Flag. I knew I was going to get down for some services. And I went and I spoke to a Sea Org member who was on the line. I th guess it's external com, now that I think about it. And there was a guy, I think his name was Freddie Ulan. I don't know if that name rings a bell with you. And uh, I spoke to him and I said, Freddie, I'm sorry, did you say you knew him? No, no, I, I've heard the name. I, I've never met, met him, though, yeah, but I've heard the name. Very, yeah. very nice guy. I said, listen, Freddie, I have some money I need to send to Herbie Parkhouse. And I'd like to make sure it gets to him. How could you do that? He says, oh, there's no problem. If we put it on the flag mailing pack, he has to sign for everything. He says, I'm sure he'd be happy to get it. So I wrote out a check and it went with the flag mail pack and that check was finally cashed. And that's what I had to do to get the money to him. Now, listen to this. This I've had my wits wrapped around thinking, why wouldn't he take the money? Yeah. And the, the only thing I can think of is this. What does the church like to deal in? leverage mm. something they have on you i guess he wanted to put it in his hip pocket that he gave me money for a van for a van and i never paid him back oh yeah i could see that Is, isn't that wild not and, really not really because they love to hold stuff over your head i know and i'll he, tell you that's what he did you well, know anyway like go on oh i was going to say the classic example in, in it you just cited it, but you know when Mark Headley was selling used equipment, uh, Golden Era on eBay. Yeah. I mean, they turn around and say that he stole money from, even though he was using his PayPal account and giving the money back to the church. Yeah. This is typical scammy Scientology. Find some angle, you know, to hang a sword over someone's head. So yeah. Herbie, Herbie got his five hundred bucks. He got his five hundred bucks, and I. You know, I felt clean. I got all the equipment back. I had to resort to trickery to get it back. And I had to resort to an unusual solution for him to accept that. Well, he had a sign for it. So there was no saying that he didn't get it or it fell through the crack on the floor or something. At any rate, that is how I got it back. And that's it's the little backstory of this album, which now is called Ron Miscavige Timeless. And again, you can get it on Amazon, iTunes, and Google Play. And I tell you, if you want a little piece of uh, what I was thinking about at the time and the music we used to play, this is a, a damn good example. And uh, I, I, well, I think your listeners would benefit from listening to it. it it's oh, something it's great, that's it's great music. Uh, Karen and I have listened yeah. to it. We thoroughly enjoy it. Uh, Ron, a couple things that, that um, struck my fancy while you were talking. Yeah. Um, first of all, you and this is really funny. First of all, you mentioned that... Uh, you know, the guy that was selling used cars over in St. Hill? Yeah. Okay. Raul, get... de, Nor Raul de Normanville. Yeah. There's... <laughs> and and for a long time, you know, um, New Time Scientology listeners will be interested in this. Uh, Scientology will, will, will encourage people who are not wealthy to go buy beat up cars, live in apartments. Yeah. You know, put all their money toward the bridge. And so Scientologists drive beaters, which is a, an American term for old cars. Yeah. And I remember in 2007 going to the uh, Scientology New Year's Eve event at the Shrine here in Los Angeles, making your way out of the Shrine 
after the event is an ad, is an adventure of itself because every four feet literally there's a reg, a Scientology salesperson with a, a bag of books trying to sell to you. Right. And, and you go all the way out the shrine toward the parking garage across the street. Yep. So, you know, I sat there and I watched cars and it's like one beat up old junky car after another. Then you would see a Mercedes and a Lexus and beat up junky cars. Then maybe a really nice, you know, uh, Mercedes Benz. Yeah. But the, but the ratio is like nine beat up junky cars to one nice car. Jeffrey, let me tell you something. One of the cars, I mean, the cars he sold me were decent. They weren't that beat up, but I, yeah. I agree with you. But one that he sold me was that beat up as you're going down the road there was a hole in the floorboard and you could see the road going by <laughs> yeah. i mean this is you if you put you stick your hand down it would rip your hand off because you get caught in the road you know yeah, like, and anyway that was that was a scene over there and uh the, the van the van i remember coming back from the last gig that we played exploded when we pulled into the driveway and it never started again so it would it ended up being a heap so <laughs> it, it, it was something else. It was something else. We were playing in uh, in London. We played at a place called The Londoner. And in those days, occasionally, we'd have a bomb scare and we'd have to go out in the street where the publican would go and look under the tables for a bomb. Was this from and, like the, the, the IRA? Yeah, from the Irish, yeah, Irish Republic. And yeah. uh, we were playing at this place called The Londoner six nights a week. And it, it was fabulous. We had just a great time. And we had a singer. We had various singers that would come in and sing with the band. And one was Annie Bright. And uh, she came in one day on a Friday and she said, well, tomorrow's my last day. I said, how come? Don't you like the band? She said, listen, I love you guys, but I am not going to sing here anymore. This is all with a thick English accent. And I said, well, what's up? She said, well, do you know that when he gets bomb scares now, he doesn't even tell anybody about the bomb scare. He just goes and looks under the tables. And if he doesn't see a bomb, he figures it's OK. Wow. Because when they would empty out the pub, half the people would leave without paying their tab. Oh, <laughs> this this is something. the stuff we were up against. I'm telling you. That's amazing. You know, just for our younger listeners, I want to say that in, in this period of time in the 70s, the Irish Republican Army was considered a terrorist group. Oh, yeah. And they were after their independence. So. Younger people can appreciate we, we, we live with terrorists today and bomb threats. And back then, the IRA used bomb threats. They, they did yeah. actually exploded some bombs. So there was there was a mood of terror yeah. uh, over the IRA in, in, in the in London, especially. But but the thing that people you would use a bomb scare to beat their tab to not pay the bill. Listen, we had further adventures with that. We were in London to see somebody about doing a gig and there was a guy there who was going to book us and we parked his car outside we come out and the car is missing and in the trunk of that car which was a big uh i forget the name of the, the brand of the car at the time but it was big was tommy armstrad's new fender Rhodes piano he almost broke down and cried so we felt what happened well there was a police station nearby we went there and sure enough they saw this big car parked in this space too long, and they thought there may, a, may be a bomb in it, and they pulled it in. We had to go there and open the trunk to show them it was just the piano in the trunk. Stuff like this would go on. Oh, yeah, cer certainly, because, you know, when you're living with that kind of uncertainty. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, and then uh, one, one, one night, we're, out, we're standing outside and um, waiting for the publican to check it and make sure it's okay. And I heard this dog barking and I looked around and I just, I couldn't see anything. And there was a guy there who was doing dog sounds, <laughs> dog imitations, who had been bugging me during various gigs to come up on stage and do these imitations. I mean, this, this is like Monty <laughs> Python stuff, right? Yeah. So look, I heard him and I said, was that you? And he showed me how he barked. So I says, well, come on in. Let, let's have a, a shot at it. It was anything goes in that place. It was like oh, Saturday yeah. night, Saturday night live. And I, so we, he gets up on the stage, and we played um, on Dolphin Street background music. And he did imitations, and he did imitations of a dog barking. Now listen, <laughs> wait, you talk about 
out reality. The guy's an Indian guy, okay? And he he did a, 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 a an imitation of a chicken crowing and stuff like that. But then he did one of a cobra fighting a mongoose. Now, who in that club would have ever seen this unless they were in India? Who knows if it was a good imitation? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but th- this is some of the stuff that went on. It was uh, really a wild time. And But the, the bottom line on it is we did the album, and uh, I'm very proud of it. And again, if, you, if you're if you looking for it, it's just called Ron Miscavige Timeless, and you can get it on Amazon, iTunes, and uh, Google Play. Yeah. And I, I, I got to mention again, I just started a new podcast. We only did one so far. I'm going to do another one this weekend, as a matter of fact. And it's called Ron Miscavige, Life After Scientology. So there's my commercials. Okay, so, and, I'm, and I'm looking at, uh, I listened to it. I really enjoyed it and uh, look forward to hearing more of you doing your podcast. The color quality, sound quality is great. Production value is very good. Yeah, well, it's, so, it's, it's very nice. straight, straight ahead off the cuff. It's live. It's not edited or anything. Yeah. So when you when you tune in, you're going to see the, the thing as it goes down, you know. I love listening to podcasts because you get so much information from from the people who lived through these time periods and things. And uh, yeah. hey, so it, and within context of the time, 1974, the Apollo All Stars, a church band, uh, yeah. starts started by Elron Hubbard on the sh- the ship, the Apollo. Yeah. When the Apollo sailed around the Mediterranean, uh, Ron Hubbard put together um, these people who were musical and they have a band and they would entertain and dance at different ports for PR reasons. Yep. But they put out this this album called Power of Source. And if you Google uh, L. Ron Hubbard, Scientology, Power of Source, you'll see the album cover. And Ron's there, Ron Hubbard's there wearing a kind of like a ball cap with a set of headphones. Yep. And around these, you know, 1970s era hipsters. Now, Ron looks really grim, really serious. And you heard the, as a professional musician, Ron, all your life, what was your opinion when you heard Power of Source? Well, let's put it this way. When I heard the title of it, I thought it was going to be spectacular. Yeah. When I heard it, I just couldn't believe that they put this out. I mean, it is, not, and I'm being very gracious when I say this, it is not sure. high quality musicianship or anything, or any aspect of it. It sounds like somebody who threw this together when they had nothing to do one weekend. And I hate to say that, but on the other hand, I was going to flag at the time for services, and I heard them play live on the stage. And I am going to tell you something. I was astonished to hear how good they sounded live. I I couldn't believe the difference. So I don't know what the hell happened between the recording of that and then later on them playing live on stage. But it was almost like it wasn't the same band. I I think they had recording problems at the time. And let's face it, somebody who hasn't done a lot of studio recording, when that light goes on, you play different than you do if you're playing live. Really, what happens? Well, I don't know. You choke. Most people will choke. And unless you're in a studio all the time, then it doesn't matter if you're playing live or you're playing in the studio. And these people who are studio musicians, and I I knew some of them. I didn't know a lot of them, but I knew some of them. We had a guy come in when I was at Gold one time because uh, Carl Leach uh, had to get some work done. He he had had to leave the area, and he couldn't be there. He was the lead trumpet player, really a good player. The guy that replaced him came in, and he played all day, and he got done in one day maybe with what would take us to do in four or five days. And he played the stuff like he had been playing it his whole life. So wow. these studio musicians are so used to just playing and at a level of expertise that it's just, in, in, you can't even imagine somebody being that good. And I saw it before my eyes. And I, I also was in a studio when they were recording a song for one of the Mission Impossible things. We went up, the gold musician was up to hear these, about a 60 piece band. And they were incredible, just incredible. But anyway, uh, that Power of Source album, I couldn't believe the difference between that and then hearing that same band live on stage. They only played one number, but the difference was almost unbelievable. And that's an interesting observation for someone who's not a musician like me, that that studio can be intimidating to people who've never 
played in the studio. Yeah. There, you know, Scientology Next puts out a uh, record called Space Jazz. And yeah. then they do the Road to Freedom. And there's a Mission Earth album. And right. on, on one of these, you hear L. Ron Hubbard singing. La thank Emboy. you for listening. Yes, yeah. thank you for listening. Right. And what was your what's, what's your take on, on that particular thank you for listening song? Well, look, I was in the Sea Org. I worked and I played on that album. And I will tell you, that album was mostly done by non-Sea Org members. Mm. We started in the studio one day and we were told we had to have this done in 30 days. And on the 30th day at 8 o'clock in the morning, Ken Mortensen and somebody else, I forget, it could have been Luigi, walked out of the studio with the masters and the recording to take it to be mastered. Well, when I say mastering, uh, it's a, a process that goes on and it kind of levels out all the songs so that you're not listening to one and then you have to turn the speakers down or turn it up to hear the next one. It, yeah. it's, uh, uh, it, it mitigates any of the loudness or quietness. And I'm, I'm saying it in the most common layman's terms. I don't want sure. to start getting into technical things. But we did that in 30 days. And that involved a lot of public Scientologists. Well, like Chick Corea as an example. And Misha Siegel. And, yeah, you had John, uh, John Travolta. John Travolta was there, yeah. Frank Stallone, Leif Oh, that, that, was, that, that was, if there's anything such as an engram, that goddamn month was an engram. Let me tell you something. Well, it I mean, were, were just, you were working 18-hour days to get this thing done? Well, you know, 18-hour day was a, a, a luxury. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, sometimes we worked through to one day, you know, up for two days in a row. Why would the church put a group of artists under such time pressure? I mean, because, create... they, because no, because there was an event coming up and it was it was wanted for the next event. Oh, I see. Why do you think, huh? Yeah, I got, so so they have to I mean, have something to sell at the next event. Yeah, I mean, let, let's face it. You know, this is a uh, when b before this happened, I remember talking to Rick Cruzen, and he said, "Well, look, there's no way we're going to get this done for the time of the event. Absolutely no way." Yeah, blah 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 blah. Word comes down, you got to get this goddamn thing for the next event. Well, there you go, and that was it. And then we're off and running. And boy, I'll tell you, there were times when we had 64 people in that studio recording and mixing this thing. That's amazing. Now you oh. got you, you play with uh, jazz superstar, jazz legend Chick Corea. Yeah. And how good is Chick? He's as good as you're gonna get. He's as yeah. good as you're gonna get. I mean, yeah. the guy is. He's like. Came down from a different planet where there's a different skill built into your DNA or something. Yeah, I love and, his and music. I, yeah. I, I I know him personally. Why well, it's stupid for me to have to say that, but a little coincidence happened. I was in England. And I went over in 1971 to do the clearing course. I was 28, 35, I think it was. Anyway, I'm in Qual one day, and there's Chick Corea, and he just attested to going clear. Huh. I was there the moment he did it. And I said, hey, congratulations, man. He said, hey, give me a big theta hug. So I gave the guy a <laughs> hug. That's, that's how I met Chick Corea. And we, amazing. We, we became very good friends. And, of course, now that I'm out and I'm a defrocked apostate, I guess, you know, it's the end of my relationship with him. But he was an absolutely sensational artist. N not even a question about it. Now, an another name. Let me drop some names. Edgar Winter uh, produced and arranged the album. Uh, Mission Earth. Yeah. How was Edgar Winter to work with? Fabulous. That was... That was the first thing I did when I was in the Sea Org. Really? I, jo I joined in summer. Well, I arrived there July 30th, 1985. And in the fall, we had Edgar Winter come out and we recorded the entire album. I, I played on that and I played a solo on a song called Bang Bang. I got a nice solo off. I did it. Listen to this. 6.30 in the goddamn morning with broken <laughs> ribs. <laughs> How did you break your ribs? Okay, I won't mention the person's name because yeah. he's, st he's still in the Sea Org and I don't want to throw him under the bus. Sure. I, I was in an office one time talking to a high exec and I had a cigarette in my right hand and a coffee in my left hand. And I feel these two arms come around me and grab me. So I exerted myself 
to kind of break his grip on me. I didn't want to throw the coffee on the floor or the cigarette. Yeah. So I just kind of expanded myself and forced my arms out. And I heard this. It was, oh. rib, it was ribs breaking. I, Everybody I, went silent. Well, why did he grab you in the first place? See, it was a hug. It wasn't, it, it wasn't oh. mean or anything. It, oh, it was just I like a, a big brother grabbing you by the head yeah. or something, you know, and yeah. doing a headlock on you. And, uh, <laughs> I could not believe it. I broke my fucking ribs. Boy, I'm sorry for that <laughs> F word, but it's okay. oh, did it hurt. Now, listen, you think they'd have some, I'd have some leeway. You know, me being yeah. the father yeah. of the chairman of the board, which is bullshit. Most of the time, they take out on me what they were afraid to take out on, on David, to be honest <laughs> with you, all right? Sure. So I'm waiting to do my solo. And what well, we got to do this first. We got to, I said, Jesus Christ, man, I don't feel that good comes it's about 6 30 in the morning i sit in the studio and i think and you mother blah 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 yeah and i got a good one off and uh, i was very pleased broken ribs and all hey the show must go on now and a question i've been dying to ask you uh isaac hayes yeah did you get to play with isaac hayes absolutely i did shows with isaac hayes i worked with him in the studio and now, how and I, go on Oh, I was going to say, I, I, I love his music. I mean, when I heard Hot Buttered Soul for the first time, I was a young man. I was like, man, this this guy is just amazing music. Um, of course, Shaft. What, how, how was he to be around? What was he like? I always hear he's a, a very nice guy. What was your, I mean, is he a great guy well, to be around? What you heard is true. Yeah. Edgar Winter, Isaac Hayes, these are, when, when you get that big of a star, you, you're not a wannabe. In other words, Edgar Winter is just a, a legend in the old time rock and roll. Isaac Hayes, you know, the, the blue R&B and stuff. And he was, he was a pleasure to be around. Never, never, never would he look down upon anybody or pull I'm important shit like that. Just a great guy to be around. He's just sometimes I'd sit in the green room with him. Or not the green room, but like when we went to the maiden voyage. I was usually the guy who went to get him for rehearsal or something. I'd sit in his stateroom for a while and we'd swap stories. And I remember him telling me when he was in high school, they were so poor that they were selling chocolate bars for to make money for the senior class. And he told me, he says, Ronnie, he says, I lived on those chocolate bars for a month. We were that poor. Wow. That is and then, really and then, then when he started making money, he paid the school for the chocolate bars. And I think they gave him an honorary diploma or something like that. But, he was just a, a wonderful guy. I, I can't say how much I really enjoyed his presence. And I was really saddened to see that he died. And you know how he died. He was he was on a, the treadmill and his wife came home and found him dead. Oh, yeah. Ter yeah. Terrible, but a, a wonderful person. Just well, a wonderful was, guy. Yeah, and it was heartbreaking the way he, uh, you know, he had a, a lot of family to support and the church made him give up his uh, job on South Park. And he was making a good buck on that too. Let me tell you, man. Yeah, he was, and 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 I think there was a lot of outrage that, uh, you know, the church basically cost him that job, and he he, he just had a a child with his yep. um, new wife, yeah, you know, his new wife, and it was really something. Um, Ron, a general question a lot of people ask me, and and I really can't answer it because I'm not an artist. Why do you think so many singers, artists, actors? What's the attraction into Scientology for them? Well, I think the bottom of the bridge is very much attractive to anybody. Any, like, look at, I remember when I got in, this is the early 70s. It, it was like for free spirits. I mean, you went in and you got uh, some great auditing. There was no uh, supernatural abilities promised to you at that level. You know, the, the first things you do is, uh, when when you get in Scientology, and uh, you you have it, it's an opening up of your your potential capabilities as far as I could see. The further sure. on you get in and you start getting promised that you're going to be a Superman, it, it it goes to hell in a handbasket. I'll be honest with you. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you what you the question you just asked me on that first podcast that I did. I have a friend of mine who was the commanding officer uh, down in Washington D.C. on as my guest. And he goes into what they used to deliver. And on a weekend, they would deliver 50 12 and a half hour intensives. Deliver, not sell it. And these people 
would walk out of there, you know, at that level, at that beginning level. I'm not talking about later on when you get hooked and you end up spending all the money in the world that you have and going bankrupt and everything. I'm talking about affordable, you know, things that you could do. And so these artists, when they come in, they feel that it, they're being validated. There's no invalidation of them. You know, a lot. there's a lot of backbiting in the, in the artistic world. You know, a guy doesn't doesn't like somebody he'll he'll try to be uh covertly bring the guy down or shit like that and you go into church that stuff doesn't go on and i think these artists feel hey this is for me and that beginning of the bridge you get hooked and that's how it's done yeah and and i could see if that if you, because the the lower bridge is engrams it's just dealing with uh handling rough areas in life and it's sort of psychotherapeutic and and yeah and, and scientology gradiently by degree pulls you in further and further and further it's exactly right and then and then that's how you can take someone like tom cruise who yeah. uh you know who who was top gun does a lot of great movies tremendous actor and then he winds up on matt lauer in 2005 ranting about psych drugs and psychiatry yeah and it's like, how do you take the biggest movie star in the world? And look, I asked Jason Begay once. We were having lunch. And Jason told me, uh, and this was after Jason, you know, made his videos. Show me a motherfucking clear. Yeah. And that, boy, that was the thing heard around the world. <laughs> uh, I'd say so. And Jason's just a force of nature anyway. Great yeah. guy. Uh, so, so Jason told me that... This, Tom Cruise as an actor just kept getting better and better and better. Yeah. And, you know, and, and Jason had a lot of admiration for this is a guy who just keeps getting better. And that was a quite a, you know, that was a compliment. Yep. And, and yet you look at Tom Cruise's professional skill level, he just gets better as an actor, but yet he can also, that, that other side you don't see is comes out on Matt Lauer where he rants about psychiatric drugs and then the leaked go to guns video where he talks about keeping Scientology working. Yeah. It's like, this is a really weird disconnect for an artist, isn't it? To be like a, a hardcore anti psych radicalized Scientologist, but yet you have this artistic face you have to present. What, so I, I don't know what to comment on it, except what you're saying is true. And well, what I'm only, just saying yeah, is it's the only thing well, I can I'll, say is this. Okay. Yeah. When you get involved in a cult like Scientology, the authoritarian personality is someone you start now, you want to emulate, emulate. You think that's the way to be. Do you follow me on that or no? Yeah, yeah, I do. Well, well yeah, a lot of people have remarked that Tom Cruise fell into David Miscavige's valence. Yep. yep. His beingness. Yeah. You know, wanting to be this hard ass cold chrome steel ethics presence that's right and i don't think tom cruise is in innately that way i mean i've had you know i met him a lot of times and uh, i thought he was well, a nice guy period so what what gets him so radicalized he wants to be the tough guy like clb like davis yeah he wants to be that and he thinks that that is the the way to be to to succeed he's duped in the thing and that that's that's not true though all but, right you know but, but conversely you take someone like isaac hayes was never that way chick korea is not that way i don't think they've ever had a close relationship with isaac hayes <clears throat> not that he wasn't very friendly with them i don't mean that because he was yeah and they, they were very friendly at events but on, like on a day-to-day -day basis i don't think they've had as much to do with him as he did with tom cruise all right. Yeah, yeah. It seemed. To, I mean, that the consensus is Tom Cruise was uh, Dave's central project. Yeah. You know, m make him the Scientology superstar. Well, Marty but, spent years getting him away from uh, who the hell was that English director? Uh, uh, Stanley Kubrick, right? Really? Well, Marty tells it on his own blog. I mean, about him auditing Tom and just trying to get him back into the fold. Because remember, for years. He kind of disappeared from the scene when he was over there making uh, Eyes Wide oh, that's Shut right. and Vanilla yeah, Sky that's right. and he, stuff yeah, like he, that. Yeah, he and Nicole Kidman. Now, see, I thought that they, I thought that um, David Miscavige worked to get him away from Nicole Kidman, but it was actually Stanley Kubrick, or maybe both. 
Well, it was to get him back into the fold, and anybody who yeah. was preventing that is had to go. That, that's the thing. That's amazing that you, that the Office of Special Affairs would write a target on someone like Stanley Kubrick. You know, I don't know. I don't know if they did that, but I know yeah. that uh, it was felt that he influenced Tom quite a bit. Having talk about Scientology and celebrities, they really haven't had any new celebrities come in for quite some time. That's right. Like the era of celebrity recruitment is actually working against them now. Yeah, I mean, you got Kirstie Alley, you had Catherine Bell, uh, you have Chick Corea, you have Tom Cruise, John Travolta, uh, Ann Archer. These are not 30-year-old people, all right? No. No, they don't have a lot of... They're not younguns, you know? Joy Villa was an interesting, uh, an interesting little slice into the Celebrity Center. Yeah. I interviewed Robbie Olson, who was... Uh, Handling her politically, you know, right. getting her, getting her an introduction to the White House and uh, Roger Stone and everyone else, Corey Lewandowski, mm-hmm. and they meddled. The Church of Scientology meddled with Joy Villa's political ambitions to the nth degree. Right to the nth degree, and as a teaser, I'm going to have some big news to break shortly. Good about about what Joy missed out on because of the Church's meddling. And, and to the, the same thing they did with Isaac Hayes' career, they meddle in the, yeah. in the lives of their artists. So when you're a Scientology celebrity, you know, you have your agent, right? But you also have the church meddling. Yep, yep. And that has got to be, that's got to be difficult to deal with as an artist because you want to be creative. Uh, now, I'm going to ask you a question if you don't know. I mean, it's, it's fine, but, you know, Beck grew up in Scientology. Right. Beck I was Hansen. very friendly with his father, David Campbell. Beck, yeah. uh, he wouldn't know me if he fell over me, to be honest with yeah. you. Now, now, Beck's music is phenomenal. Yeah. You know, very popular artist, and he seems to keep a very low profile about Scientology. That's very true. And it seems like more and more celebrity Scientologists are keeping a low profile just out of self-preservation of their careers. I agree, and because you get associated with it, and the the thought about what Scientology is or how much they are revered by the public or liked, I don't think it's any good at all these days. No. And, and let's, in fact, let's go to the Super Bowl commercial by way of ending off. Yeah. The 2018 Super Bowl commercial Patriots versus the Eagles. Yep. We're, we're all watching the game here in America and suddenly you have curious about Scientology. We thought so. What was oh, your boy. impression of, what was your impression of the Super Bowl ad? I am not curious about Scientology and I don't <laughs> think that very many people are curious about it. I think yeah. they think it's bad, okay? And yeah. I, I'm talking down now because I will tell you I couldn't believe it. It was really it, funny. It, it's like they're talking down to the public. Jesus Christ, man. Well, they are and I'll tell you uh, Ron what stood out to me is one one ironclad rule set up by uh, Mr. Hubbard himself, source. Yeah. He, he said that the auditor never evaluates for the pre-clear. Right. And, and what this means is that you, the person being audited, the auditor will never evaluate for you. And that's what they so, did. Well, that's what they did because they said, curious. And instead of just letting you answer the question, as would happen in an auditing session, they said, we thought so. Arrogant. Thought, uh, in other words, arrogant. There you go. Well, it, it also violates the number one rule of auditing. There's yeah. no self-determination. There's no letting the pre-clear originate. Yep. It was sort of curious. We thought so. Well, wait a minute. Leah uh, Remini tweeted, hashtag not curious. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now, I did an article on the Scientology Money Project, Ron. What's interesting is their initial statistics they posted, they showed, okay, the Super Bowl ad campaign cost the church of Scientology a couple million dollars, right? Right. And they posted a diagram, I think, the day after showing they had spent $383,000 in pay-for-click advertising. Wow. They spent between $0.64 cents and $0.78 cents per click to get people to the Scientology website. Wow. Right? So they're yeah. spending, so they're, it's not people are curious. They're spending several million dollars on a Super Bowl ad, several hundred thousand dollars for clicks to get people to go to their damn site. And 
if people investigate Scientology using Google, they're going to find out all the bad stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's like it was like, why would you? And Stephen Colbert famously lampooned this. I mean, a brilliant piece of satire. Stephen Colbert said, uh, it's not a good idea to use Google to ask what is Scientology. And he said it would, Stephen Colbert said that would be like O.J. Simpson telling people to Google me. I'm a famous football player. Yeah, no kidding, man. So if you no uh, kidding, boy, I'll tell you, it's just it's, it's going to backfire <laughs> on them. But yeah, it is. I, I guess they're at their wits' end, and you, you, if they just came clean, uh, look, I, I tell this, I told it in the book, I told it on my podcast. Three things. First of all, give a general amnesty, forgive everybody, let the crap hit the fan. Number two, cancel all disconnection immediately and number three only sell those services that you can deliver the end product and make it available so that a person who works for a living can afford to buy it those three things would at least possibly maybe in the remotest sense give them a chance of surviving this because right now they're like the titanic and they have all the hatches Batten down, but there's too too much water, and the, the ship is not going to uh, sail anymore. But the odds of them doing that, and I tell this on my podcast, would be the same odds as a pelican coming in the room and playing a jazz saxophone. And I'll be honest with you, <laughs> I would put my money on the pelican. No kidding. Yeah, because that ship is going down. Yeah, and it's going down hard. And the only curiosity is how soon will the ship of Scientology sink. Yeah. That's what people are curious about. Ron, thank you so much for being on the show. Good. I appreciate you calling me, and I enjoyed yeah. it, too. I, I'm, yeah, I'm glad I spoke to you about this. Go out and listen to Ron Miscavige's Timeless, available on Amazon. Right. And also, we look forward to your podcast. It's uh, called Ron Miscavige, Life After Scientology. Life After Scientology. Yeah. And that's, that that's, says everything. Ron, thank you so much, and we look forward to catching up with you again in the future. For Surviving Scientology, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you for listening. As always, we'll be in very good touch.